Hi, buddy. <laughs> How was your week? Anybody do anything really awesome with all the tools that I showed you? No? Okay. Yeah? <laughs> I, I run into a problem. Uh, you have a problem? Yes, I, I run into a problem. Uh, I followed the 2018 terminal video. Yeah. And for some reason, that won't Yeah, things like that tend to change over the years like I mean th how did you install it that's that would explain why it didn't work in paper space we used it so the paper space instances come with Jupyter lab hmm, maybe they don't uh, the new the okay so I'll actually get to that because I'm going to talk about paper space later today so Okay, so today I'm going to talk about, we're going to start to slowly shift into sort of deep learning land. Um, all of, most of the stuff that we've looked at so far has not necessarily made use of kind of the new advancements that we've seen over the last couple of years in the world of deep learning. And um, the thing that deep learning really gives us is the ability to kind of... Um, work with raw media, so images, sounds, and text. The stuff that we were looking at also kind of works, well, we did do some deep learning stuff sort of uh, without, actually, uh, without actually acknowledging it. So for example, when we show CovNet Predictor, for example, that uses a convolutional neural network, um, but we didn't really necessarily, and we talked about how convolutional neural networks work, but we didn't necessarily show any applications of them um, except for CovNet Predictor, basically. So today we're gonna, and, la and last week we talked about things like TSNI, which also make use of CubeNet. So okay, maybe I'm, I'm not exactly accurate about that. We have been using some deep learning, but now we're gonna get into stuff that has been sort of recently enabled by deep learning, and recently meaning the last five, six, seven years. And um, I'm going to, this will be a nice sort of lead up to the generative, mo generative models module of this course. So later, um, basically after the presentations, um, we're going to be um, getting into generative models. And by the way, this is, um, this is the last, uh, wait, is that right? No, we'll have class next week, right? I forgot, yeah. So next week, um, let's see how we, we shift things around. So we have class next week, and then uh, we'll be off for one week. I'm gonna be out of town between next week's class and two weeks after that. Um, so, and the two weeks after that will be October 22nd, we'll be doing when we'll be um, starting uh, presentations. I think maybe we'll even just start generative models next week, even though it won't necessarily be um, early enough for you to, well, who knows, like maybe some of you will be adventurous enough to just use it for the 22nd, it's totally acceptable. But we'll talk about that later. Um, uh, today, we're getting into some visual applications, mostly of deep learning, which do not, uh, which are not generative models technically, although they certainly have a lot in common with them. And we'll, we'll kind of explore the difference a little bit between what we mean by generative models and, and these, um, these sort of optimization-based techniques. Um, and, and today the, the lecture should be relatively short, like hopefully it won't even be, I think even before lunch, I'd, I'd like to start actually showing you stuff. So um, the two things I wanna talk about are at lunch, did I say lunch? Uh, <laughs> between break. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm actually a little hungry. Yeah. Um, so I'll show you Deep Dream, um, which is kind of the, well, we'll talk about Deep Dream, what, what it is. I'll show you Deep Dream and Style Transfer. And these two techniques are sort of um, techniques that make use of deep neural networks but are not, specific, are not explicitly generative models. Although it gets a little bit complicated because Style Transfer can be a, from a generative model, but but we'll, we'll talk about those sort of finer details later. Um, you're gonna learn how to make stuff like this. Um, and actually like, not everything to make all this kind of stuff because there's various sort of techniques that I've put online but are not necessarily well documented, but I'll show you how to make the basics of this kind of stuff. And so um, you know, maybe people will be interested, especially those of you who wanna make the visuals. Um, and uh, and yeah, and this is, it's a good time to mention that a lot of the stuff that we'll be looking at increasingly is built upon these deep learning frameworks. And a lot has really changed in the last 10, 15 years. It used to be that machine learning was kind of done in a lot of proprietary 
environments. So MATLAB is probably chief among them. I started with MATLAB and MATLAB was just, you know, this kind of thing that you would need an expensive license for. And then MATLAB would be making use of all these external libraries that were written in different languages and it would be really, really painful. Now things are, not to say that they're painless, but if you know your way around the terminal, which I hope, which I hope you are increasingly finding yourself doing, then um, a lot of this stuff becomes actually quite accessible, even if you don't understand the inner workings of them. We'll be looking at, uh, today we'll be mainly using TensorFlow code and actually a little bit of Torch code. I don't even have Torch here. The original Torch, um, which is Lua based. I don't know Lua, but you can use, you know, a lot of Lua. You can use Torch, which is based in Lua um, from the command line. So you'll kind of learn how to use some of those things. Um, we probably won't really use Keras in this class just because we won't necessarily need it, but for those of you who, who want to learn more like how to write neural networks, how to actually write Python code that compiles neural networks, then Keras is a really good starting environment. K-E-R-A-S. It's a, it's a um, sort of, it's the, it's, it is to TensorFlow what processing is to Java. Let's think of it that way. And so it makes it really, really relatively straightforward to write, you know, code with neural networks and, and kind of get stuff, you know, prototypable. Um, and there's other frameworks that are, that, you know, that are around. We're not gonna, I, I don't use MXNet. Theano's basically is probably an almost discontinued project. Theano's kind of like the original TensorFlow, so it's increasingly not maintained. I think maybe it's officially not maintained anymore. Cafe is still out there for computer vision researchers, and then my favorite is Darknet. Uh, not because it's the most functional, but because it has, it's the, just like the weirdest. You can see this is an actual deep learning framework called Darknet. And it's made by um, a really zany person named Joseph Redman. Um, but we'll, yeah, we'll kind of talk about that later. Okay, so um, I just mentioned this. You know, you can think of, this is a roughly accurate analogy. What processing is to Java, Keras is the TensorFlow, ML5 is the TensorFlow.js. Um, we're not going to actually, we're going to use TensorFlow code from the command line, so we won't really need Keras. But, um, but I'll, I, I will show you, I have guides that use Keras that, that may be useful for some of you. It, it's, it's slightly tangential to the class, but um, probably still kind of useful. So this is the road ahead. Um, uh, this is actually wrong, actually. <laughs> Uh, because the mini presentations are actually not next week. They're, they are, I guess they're actually here. Yeah, I think it'll make sense to just, you know, we're a week ahead of schedule compared to last year. That's kind of nice. I, don't, I wonder why that is. Uh, uh, did I forget to cover something? Yes. No, but that was always a, um, that wasn't an actual, that was not. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think, oh, I see what's going on here because because I was thinking of generative models one and two as two separate lectures, but because but because the mini presentations will take at least half of one class, it, it will really be over three weeks. I think this makes sense. Anyway, we'll figure it out. The point is that um, next week we'll get into general models. Mini presentations is week seven. Um, so... Uh, I've mentioned them a couple times, but I have a slide later, you know, this is what we kind of said. There's really no requirements. I mean, you know, just show something cool. Show, show me that you try. Show me that you care. You know. so, sorry? I'm sorry? What was it? Yeah, more or less. Um, let's see here. Something like this, I think. Um, we'll probably, maybe, depending on how much time we have, you know. Um, okay, so who else edits their slides in the middle of lectures? Mm -hmm. Is that, <laughs> is that, is that, oh, okay. anyway, yeah, I, I know, I know, fair enough. <laughs> okay, so today we'll talk about these, vi we'll talk about visualization, deep dream, and texture. So today will be very visual heavy, so um, I hope you're, I hope you like that. Okay, oh yeah, and then, and then, you know, basically the next three weeks after that, including mini presentations will be getting into generative models and that will be like um, you know showing you things like GANs and autoencoders and um, mostly GANs and then also like picks to picks type stuff 
And um, fortunately, Runway is going to make a lot of this a lot simpler than it was last year, which is going to which is going to help us kind of cover it a little quicker, I hope. And week nine to ten, we'll we'll um, we'll kind of pick and choose from this. Last year, I did a reinforcement learning and an NLP section. And we did talk about our, I basically squeezed everything in. I think we'll probably end up doing something like that again, um, just because I like to give you breadth. This is a course to show you what's possible um, because by next year, all of this is obsolete anyway. I mean, in terms of the technical materials. And then um, the, the something futuristic last year was basically the lead into the autonomous artificial artist class that I taught in the spring and we'll be teaching again this spring, um, which um, yeah. I think I think we'll kind of well we'll let this be mysterious for now and then, and then the whole last week will be will be um, major presentations not mini presentations but big ones, which um, in which everyone will have more time to kind of show what they're what they're working on. We'll we'll get this is it's still a little too early to think about this, but probably after mini presentations we'll talk about it. Okay, so a very, very tiny review of the last three weeks of, of lecture material. We introduced convolutional neural networks. We talked about a little bit how they work. And if you've forgotten a lot of the details, you know, about, about you know, activations and filters and stuff like that, um, the main things to understand is that a deep neural network, a convolutional neural network, let's say, is, is, is a neural network that's composed of layers which, uh, which increasingly abstract uh, the representation of the input into higher and higher level features. So in the first, in the early layers, you'll, you'll get a whole image which has, you know, just a bunch of pixels. And the neural network will convert these pixels into activation maps. And these activation maps are like, kind of like images, except instead of having pixels, like RGB pixels, they show the presence of low layer features and features in the first first couple of layers are things that look for really simple patterns you know edges corners gradients things like that uh, maybe patches of pink patches of green this these kinds of things and then as it goes it will continue to take whatever it received from the last layer and abstract it further. So, it, so the, the activation maps in one layer, which show you the presence of small features, will get converted into activation maps of more complicated features. So things that combine edges or gradients or patches of pink and green into sort of more complicated features. And as it goes through the layers, the uh, effective size of the features that it looks for in terms of the the, num the pixels in the original image grows until you get to the last layer in which it's classifying. If, it's a cla if the network is for classification, which is most of the ones we showed, it'll just give you a feature. You know, you could think of the classification as the final feature. And that feature is, is this a dog? Is it a cat? Is it a car? Is it a, you know, rain jacket, whatever? Yeah? Is that at the end? Is that so uh, here... Yeah, um, this, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so SVM in a more narrow context can just mean a type of activation. Okay. So like, you know, this is the way that deep learning people will think of it. Like in the past, um, when we were just using SVMs, it would be basically be just this, like it would just be this. And then all of this other stuff wasn't here yet. Right, yeah. This is kind of all the stuff that you can attach an SVM at the end if okay. you, if you want. Um, and that's a very typical, yeah. Yeah, it's it's actually also not even really necessarily used all that much now. Like usually now it's just softmax, like which is which is your. I, I showed those like really probably for us a little bit beyond beyond scope, but yeah, um, yeah. Oh, well, th this is just an example, but okay, you can see that, that the activation maps shrink. And so if you think of it, if you think about it, this represents the entire image and it's been shrinking, which is sort of like downsampling it. So one pixel here mm -hmm. refers to a much bigger part of the original image. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So is it like uh, the, the, like the blackening part you were talking before? 
Uh, yeah, that's 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 uh, you can actually see that. Um, oh, and the, okay, so here it doesn't actually show the pooling layers, but pooling is what does that. Um, another way of doing, and pooling is actually becoming sort of slowly going out of fashion. And the, another way of doing it is using these convolutional layers that skip, sort of like they instead of going one by one, they go two by two, let's say, and then you get sort of the same effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, and then we talked about, uh, and feel free, anybody can also like you know we can always if you if you have any questions. Um, one thing is with this class, I know sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish between information which I'm giving you because it's interesting. Um, and information that I'm giving you that because it's because it's sort of like required knowledge to to understand the tools that we're using. For me, it's it's very blurry. You know, the more of the underlying stuff you understand, the more that you're probably in a position to kind of you know be able to pick and choose among GANs, No, no, you know, no why certain things look the way they look, or or maybe have better intuitions about how the tools will work on the data sets you compile, let's say. But um, a lot of this can be used in the sort of, you know, ML5-like way. Like ML5 um, really does a much more, it, it hides like a lot of the stuff more than, than I actually think is good, personally. <laughs> but, but, um, but it's useful for that in a sense, you know, it makes it a lot more approachable and, and so on. So sometimes, um, but but I, I, I kind of uh, leave more of the wires exposed, you know, so that you may shock yourselves a little bit if you grab reach out and grab them. Um, okay, so this, this is probably a bit out of, yeah, we talked about how, so okay, the, you just remember like the whole idea with neural networks is that they're feature extractors, right? And so at each layer they, they have these feature extractors, which might be, for example, in the convolutional layer, it's one of these filters. It's a feature extractor. It, you know, it, it finds how much of a particular feature is present in every part of the image. And, um, and you know, we saw how in a one layer neural network, these, you know, one, if you have a one layer neural network, the feature extractors are just the classes themselves because you, it doesn't have any time to do something more detailed or compositional. Um, in a two layer neural network, it might abstract it a little bit. Um, and so here, now it has some time to take more um, low-level features and then combine the low-level features into high-level features. And that tends to do a better job because, um, you know, it can, it can learn. So, I mean, you, you have this intuition in your brain, right? Let's say, um, okay, let, let's, let, I'm going to use this analogy. Uh, you all have a model in your head of what cars might look like, right? And um, you have it because you've seen lots and lots of cars. Um, now, you've seen a limited amount of cars. Maybe you've seen, well, okay, maybe you've seen a lot of cars because you drive, but let's say, let's say I showed you a car in a color that you had never seen before, you know. Um, you would recognize it as still a car, even though it has a color that you haven't seen before. Um, and that's because you, the model that you have of cars isn't like, a copy of every possible car that you've ever seen. It's a set of features that define cars, you know, roof and windows and car handles and doors. And so that you have a sort of compressed uh, version, uh, a sort of simpler, simplified model of what cars are. You know, if, you're, if your model of cars were this, you would have to have, um, you know, a feature extractor that memorized every possible car you've ever seen. But really, it's it, you, you kind of learn it in steps and so that you are able to kind of have a, uh, not only are you able to compress your, your car recognition, but you're able to reuse a lot of the features that you associate with cars. You can associate them also with trucks and vans and, and things like that. And so that really helps you make use of the precious neurons that you have um, because, you know, several hundreds of, I think hundreds of billions, who knows? Hundreds of billions, I think. Number of neurons you have, it's really not, not enough to capture all of the world's complexity without kind of trying to reuse things. 
And so that's 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 roughly speaking how these work. And, and actually, like all of the research came from brain research originally. That's why they're called neural networks. And so um, there's actually a lot of overlap there, metaphorical anyway. We, talk, <laughs> we talked about these poor kitties and how they, you know, had their electrodes kind of show in their brains kind of showed us that that uh, the mammalian mammalian like the male visual cort uh, not male mammal mammalian <laughs> visual cortex uh, works kind of like a convolutional neural network and so there's I mean it's a lot more complicated but roughly first order approximation that's roughly accurate something like that and um, I showed you some applications. Covenant Dior lets you look at the look at look at the activations. And there's various versions of this online. Um, okay, now let's talk about visual. So we've kind of reviewed stuff. Now let's talk about visualization, and this will lead up to deep dream and style transfer. Um, now, one of the things that has happened in a deep learning age is that we have replaced what a lot of what used to be manual. And we've replaced it with things that are much more automatic, right? So in the past, computer vision worked, as I mentioned, like in the first week or second week maybe, computer vision kind of worked in the following way. You would take an image, you would apply a bunch of uh, handcrafted feature extractors that computer vision experts had designed. And because they had designed them, they had a lot of, there was a lot of scientific background about why these particular feature extractors are good or, or why they are the informative. Um, and then we found out that really this doesn't work as well as it could because, well, we don't know necessarily all the best scientific features of, of various tasks. And then there's all these other advantages as well uh, for trying to automate that. Yeah, I mean, it's faster, of course, and also because it's re it applies to other tasks, you know, because different tasks need different features. And so it's not necessarily, it's very difficult to have to start this process over and over and over for every possible task we want a machine learning system to do. And so we figured out how to automate this process in convolutional neural networks and deep neural networks where we said, okay, we're gonna get rid of all these handcrafted features and we're just going to let the neural networks discover them. Um, and they, the way they discover them is using gradient descent. So gradient descent is this technique which optimizes the feature extractors uh, to uh, uh, d doing the task that it's being trained to do accurately. Right? We want it to be as accurate as possible and gradient descent kind of guides this feature, uh, feature extraction process. So it, got, it figures out what the best features are to use. Now those features themselves are not exactly obvious what they are anymore, right? So when we when we did computer vision using really well known features that had you know tons of scientific literature, were maybe based on on, on studies of, of visual systems, uh, we knew very very well what they were seeing, um, and by automating this process, the computer figured out its own features, and they're not necessarily very easy to understand. And number, well, so that's, that can be annoying because um, we want to understand their technologies, right? We want to understand what they're actually doing. Uh, we want to understand the basis for their decisions, right? And this has kind of been a hot topic over the last few years, especially in the policy arena. It's like if, if we let machine learning systems... Um, I'm always looking this way. I feel like I'm really <laughs> neglecting you guys. I'm going to, uh, sorry, I'm going try to try to be more fair. So in the policy arena, one of the things, you know, we, it's very unnatural for me somehow. Like, but, you know, it's because of the window, I think it really is distracting. So um, I really, um, oh yeah, so, so yeah, in the policy arena, you know, one of the things is we're, we're trying to give neural networks and machine learning systems more authority. And, um, you know, giving them more authority means that, means that, um, when they make a decision that has consequences, um, we you know we may want to understand why they actually did that because then we can maybe if they do something bad, we we need to be able to backtrack our steps and kind of figure out how to um, well how to either correct it or to punish it or to to you know prevent it from doing things that we don't like, and so people began to sort of clamor for um, things that would help us understand these neural networks. And so some of the early work in vision systems 
um, happened right here at NYU, in fact, um, by, um, by who was then a grad student at the time, Matt Zeiler, and um, his PI is Rob Fergus. Um, and they started working, and there's some prelude to this, but this is kind of one of the landmark papers, you can look this up, where they, they um, figured out some techniques for visualizing, uh, visualizing neural networks. And by visualizing, I mean um, using visual methods to figure out what they're doing, to kind of give us human readable clues about what, what they are, in particular in vision systems, what they're looking for. Um, and, so that, and, and so that would be a kind of useful way for us to understand them. And uh, what they did, they did a few things. And the, the first thing I'll show you is actually really simple. So remember that when you, um, when you have one of these convolutional neural networks, you have a feature extractor, which is being slid across the entire image plane. And then it's giving us, a, uh, it's showing us how much of that feature is present, right? And so the brighter the image, the brighter the pixel, the more of that feature is present. And the darker it is, the less of that feature is present. These are, these are the activations, right? And so one really simple thing you can do is you can feed these neural networks lots and lots of real images and then save the patches of the images which activated a particular neuron the most, right? So if this feature extractor is looking for some particular feature, where did it find that feature the most? And then just show us a lot of that, right? Um, so for example, in the early layers, it, you have, so, uh, so these nine little tiny images right here, where my mouse is hovering. So this, this shows us one feature extractor and it's saving patches of real images. These are little bits of actual photos that pass through the neural network. And these are the patches which activated that neuron the most. And so you can see that they look kind of similar. They all seem to have this like kind of diagonal line that goes uh, across them. And so you can look at that and you go, oh, this neuron must be looking for diagonal lines, right? And then maybe this neuron right here is looking for just patches of green. You know, it'll activate for patches of green. And this one is looking for diagonal lines that go this way. Um, and then maybe, you know, and you can, you can kind of see that they all, each of these grids, they, they show a similar feature. And, and actually, these are the actual weights right here. So this corresponds to this. And it's looking for a feature that's roughly at this angle. And this is looking for a diagonal line that's roughly at this angle. This is just looking for green and so on. And so, you know, that gives us a, a, a pretty simple way of visual, you know, trying to gain some insights as to each of these neurons. Now, of course, at the first layer, it's looking for really abstract things like edges, right? But if we take this further, and look at later, if we do apply this to the later layers, we uh, learn a lot, we, we learn a lot more abstract features. So here, this is like the, I don't remember, the third or fourth layer, let's say. And this neuron seems to like, well, I don't know, we can, wavy lines or something. And this looks, likes parallel lines. And this likes rings, right? It even got an eye that looks like an eye, right? Rings, eyes, patches of orange, more rings. Later, they get, get even more complicated. So this, all of these, one neuron, this is one of the maybe, let's say, fifth or sixth layer, something like that. All of these look really different, you know, in terms of their color composition and their shape, but they all appear to be kind of like lattices, repeating shapes. So maybe this is a neuron that likes repeating shapes, you know, or lattices. Um, Maybe this is a neuron that likes, I don't know, this one's really weird. I mean, there's a couple of bird beaks, there's random like upper body thing, I don't know. Sometimes it's, it's still kind of hard to tell sometimes, but um, this is a nice one. This one is detecting text. It's a text detector, text and barcodes, right? Um, this is detecting upper bodies, right? Um, this one is detecting, I don't know what that is. It looks like, what is it? What? It, what? It fluffy, fluffy things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fair enough. Um, so, so, so you can kind of get get some insights that way. So, now um, this is kind of useful, right? Um, and that, yeah. 
The neuron uh, is trained to find a particular feature. Um, and this technique helps us figure out later what that neuron is looking for. Right? Um, the images don't do anything. They're, they're just images. We're using the images in order to gain insights about the network. Mm -hmm. um, so this visualization technique is pretty cool, right? But now we can kind of invert it, right? And um, this is beginning to lead up to Deep Dream. Um, first of all, how many of you know what I'm talking about when I say Deep Dream? Maybe half of you. I, I don't mean necessarily know it in detail, but know, have heard of this term. Um, it's, it's already a couple of years now, but Deep Dream was kind of this thing that came out, I'm gonna show you in a second, but it came out by Google a few years ago that kind of took this technique to the next level. And um, it, for a while, it was it was super popular on the internet and stuff, and it, it kind of like helped propel. Um, it it really kind of helped kickstart the whole this whole AI art thing, it, and you know that's been kind of like continuing. And um, it, the funny thing is that it really kind of grew out of scientific research. Like it wasn't made for art necessarily. It kind of grew out of scientific research, and and we're getting into that now. So. Uh, feature visualization is, you know, useful enough, but here's another way of visualizing the features, right? Um, so we're going to slightly change this idea, and here's, and here's how we're going to do it. So these are patches of real images which maximally activate this neuron, right? That's, that's what we just showed, right? So now, what if we change this in the following way? Instead of, uh, yeah? Can we uh, take these images from like a data set to, and show it at the neural network to see? Okay. Yeah. Um, now, um, what if we did it in the following way? Instead of, once we have this trained neural network, instead of feeding it images from a data set and then, and then saving the patches that, that activated that neuron the most, what if instead we try to synthesize images uh, which maximally activated that neuron, right? Well, so let, like, let's say I took this neuron and I said, um, what hypothetical image would activate this neuron the most? Can we construct an image that would really, really activate this neuron the most? Um, yeah? Or maybe you're gonna get this, but uh, if we're look, thinking about the, the covenant visualizer that you, you were showing us before with the cat, mm -hmm. um, and sort of the grid of different cats, would a would an image that's optimal for a neuron be represented in that grid as basically just like a white square because every pixel in it is theoretically... Yeah, I mean, it would never be like a white square, um, but uh, but sort of like, it would be sort of like a, what, what we'll see later, we'll talk about this visual importance. Um, this is another technique that lets you identify like the visually important parts. Never be a white square, like there's always irrelevant stuff. Um, but um, in this technique, maybe we can actually make it basically a white square. Yeah. Uh, was there another question? No. So um, so okay. Like this would be the the idea is instead of instead of taking images from data sets, maybe we can create images, um, which would maximally activate a particular neuron. And so that was, uh, and that actually predates the 2013 work. This is actually pretty old. This is already from. 2009, 2010, I think. Um, there was some work in doing exactly that. So the idea was you have these convolutional neural, neural networks. Can we um, visualize what a particular neuron is looking for by trying to synthesize an image which would maximally activate that neuron? And in this case, they were actually trying to maximally activate a neuron which was designed to uh, distinguish between a bunch of these different classes, right? So the, the early work in this took a very naive approach, um, like the way, so I don't know if I have slides that show, okay, I, I'll, I'll describe a little bit about how this works. The, the, the um, okay, so, so let's say you're trying to make a neural network that um, would, maxim, uh, you were trying to make an image which would maximally activate the part of a neural network that, that responds to bell peppers, right? 
or computer keyboards or ostrich oops, or ostriches or lemons right and you can kind of see the outlines of these features here it doesn't look particularly nice but 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 you can see the resemblance right and um, these images have that property so if you feed this image into the neural network the bell pepper neuron will go yes bell pepper bell pepper right um, ostrich ostrich right it, and it's, it's pretty creepy even <laughs> but um, now okay so how would we do this right so um, the I don't I don't actually have really good slides about this um, but the intuition is that you can do this in a way that's very very similar to training a neural network right so how do we train a neural network we we're trying to optimize for some task like classification and we have to adjust the weights so that it optimizes that task right and we can do that using gradient descent so this works almost exactly the same except instead of optimizing the weights of the neural network we are optimizing something else we're, um, we're optimizing the pixels of an image the weights of the neural network are frozen they they are we've already trained the neural network and the weights are held frozen you can take an image plane and put and put and pass it through a neural network and then measure all of its classifications right and then you can use gradient descent to adjust the pixels so to make the uh, classification of whatever neuron you're interested in go up higher would you start with just like would you start with like white noise yeah white noise you know typically yeah and there's more clever techniques but that's a that's a good start yeah i wonder if you would just be different for what would you try to do with something well you started with the white I mean, every time you initialize white noise, you're gonna you're gonna get a completely different right because every white noise is different. Yeah. Um, so um, so that that's so basically what exactly that you would take an image, and you would initialize it randomly. So that white noise means just random pixel values, right? And then you would take this image and you would pass it through this neural network. And then you'd look at the bell pepper neuron and it would, you know, probably have a very low activation. And then you can use gradient descent to figure out how to change all of the pixels so as to make the bell pepper activation go higher. And you would do this repeatedly with gradient descent. And gradually it would converge on something that looked like this. And every time you do it, it would look different. Um, you know, maybe the bell peppers would be in different places, basically. Um, but slowly, this would converge upon something that looks like this. Now, it's pretty ugly, but, um, but it kind of works. And it would give you some insights as to, well, in this case, like, you already know that it's a bell pepper neuron, but maybe you haven't, la maybe your neurons aren't labeled because they're not, you know, they're earlier in the network. And so you don't know what they're looking for, and maybe you want to figure that out. So that's one way of doing it. And, and actually, the first, when they released, uh, there was another paper follow-up by, uh, a researcher who's now Google, um, where they found they like scraped all of YouTube, and they figured out the optimal stimulus for a face. And this is this is old stuff now, right? No one's impressed by this anymore. But actually, back in 2011 or whatever it was, this was actually really cool. It was like we synthesized the optimal stimulus for a face neuron, and then of course the optimal stimulus for a cat neuron. And they they the way that they got this image was by downloading YouTube videos of cats and just training a neural network to recognize the cats after they labeled them. Um, and then, you know, using this technique. So um, this is in 2012. This was like the Google cat. I think if, I, th I bet if you, I bet if you Google, let's try this actually. If you Google Google cat, I think it's gonna be that. Um, no. Okay, maybe not. Um, Quark Lay. Well, that's Quark Lay. Um, there, there it is. Here's the the big cat. Anyway, fine. Um, so experiment failed. Um, oh, let me do a quick thing. I'm trying to keep some space here. So that's four extra gigabytes. Okay, back to the slides. 
Um, okay. Now, this was 2012. This took a big step forward in 2015. Who saw, who remembers this? Or, or more importantly, um, oh, actually, I don't have the, I'll show you in a second. Okay, fine. So actually, this was the blog post. We can look at this. So this is a blog post in 2015 by three um, research engineers at Google, um, Alex Morgvinsev, Chris Ola, and Mike Taika. Um, and they wrote this thing called Inceptionism, going deeper into neural networks. And this, this really, for me, was kind of a big moment because I'd been doing a lot of machine learning stuff, but it was really, really separate for me from my open frameworks processing art practice. And this was the first time that, that I noticed that the, you know, like, uh, uh, generative artists and new media people, interactivity people were, suddenly became interested in neural networks because they were able to do this kind of stuff. And so what they showed, first of all, they reviewed the thing that we were just talking about, this idea of taking an image and optimizing it so that it would, so that it would look like a particular neuron, uh, so that it would look like, so that it activate a particular, you know, uh, neuron which was looking for something. Like this was looking for bananas, right? This neuron's looking for bananas, so we can take random noise and, and adjust the pixels until it activates the banana neuron sufficiently. And so they showed this with different, you know, heart of beast, measuring cup, ants, starfish, parachutes. So this is kind of cool. Like, look at, notice this with the parachute, that it, you see a parachute in here, and it also looks like there's somebody, it looks like a little person hanging off the parachute, right? And um, you might think like, well, that's not a parachute, that's a person, right? But how does the neural network know, right? If you give it a million images that are labeled parachute, it's going to try to learn the, you know, the essentials of those images. And maybe many of those images also have things associated with parachutes, like people. Um, and, and so you get this kind of, you know, this, this little bias. Um, yeah? Yeah, I'm just curious, I guess I've always started with noise. Um, I mean, they, they, it's like all the resulting images have this sort of rainbow effect. You know, like the, the pixel bits are all kind of, you know, something like that. I'm not sure what you mean, rainbow. Like, the pixel, like, the pixels have this sort of, like, psychedelic all kinds of colors, like, almost if you averaged out the pixel values, it's still average compared to, like, you look at it, like, you know, patches of <coughs> all kinds of, well, like, 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 if you zoom in close, you don't look so like white noise, right? Yeah, I mean, okay, so there's... Like if you started with, like, an all-white canvas, like, yeah. would you get, like, would the banana just be yellow and then, like, white? I think if you started everything at the same value, it would actually wouldn't work because then there's no signal. Um, there needs to be differences between the pixels. Oh, gotcha. I mean, I'm not 100% sure about that, actually. It's a good question, but... Uh, I mean, you know, okay, you see these lower layer features, like, maybe yeah. here you kind of see these... And, and part of that is because the activations will go up higher if it also finds the lower layer features that make up that, you know, like maybe there's a particular lower layer feature that's really useful for finding measuring cups. And, you know, it's kind of like, like at that point, it's... Like the yeah, I mean, you can interpret it if you want, but it, at some point you're going down the rabbit hole. It's like, it's really kind of like a neural network doing statistical analysis really deeply. Yeah. Um, okay, so that, that's, that, that's them reviewing what we've shown so far and actually making it look a lot better. Notice that this looks a lot better than, than, uh, than this, um, right? So they, they added some, some techniques that kind of improved this process. And mainly, what, because this process, it just, used stand, it just used gradient descent on the pixel values, holding the weights uh, fixed. And that works okay, but... Um, but it produces things that look kind of like this, right? And so uh, the way that they can improve this is, um, and we'll, we'll actually see this in the notebook, we're gonna show a deep dream notebook basically, but the way to do it is by looking features at multiple scales, and also by using these computer vision technique, uh, computer vision technique called the Laplacian filter, and that's something we're not really gonna look at, I don't even really understand it myself, but, um, but, uh, but they made it more colorful, and we like that, so. Um, and actually, let me go back to this. So then, um, look at all these dumbbells that have arms attached to them, right? So, um, so then, that was, that was that, right? Now, but what is Deep Dream? Deep Dream was actually taking this technique and, and changing it slightly. And here's the idea with Deep Dream. So they would take, instead of uh, starting with white noise, 
and then adjusting the pixels so that it activated a particular neuron, you do the following thing. And this is something that Alex Mordvinsev came up with. And, and he's now, he now seems to be transitioning to a full-time artist, I think, which is, which is really great. So the, the idea is this. Now you take an image, any image, like a real photograph, like a photograph of these gazelles or whatever, or I don't know, these are harder beasts, I think. I don't know what they are. I always call them harder beasts, but anyone know what this animal is? Oh, it's an ibis. Right, right, okay. So, okay, so the idea is you start with one of these, you, this image, right? You pass it through the neural network, and now, instead of using gradient descent to optimize one particular neuron, you do the following thing. You take the activations that it found, and you, you do gradient descent in order to make all of the activations bigger. So activations show us the presence of a particular feature, right? So we want, the, we want those activations to rise, all of them, literally all of them. And so, or not necessarily all of them, but let's say all of them in a particular layer, all, all of them in a subset of neurons, like you can play with that, that idea. But the point is, whatever it finds, make more of it, right? And so if you, if you select, let's say, one of the early layers, and you do this process, and you use gradient descent to change the pixels so as to make all of the activations higher, like a feedback loop, whatever it finds, make it higher. And it, it really is a feedback loop, right? Because whatever things that it finds, that's going to be the things that it tries to make more of, right? Um, so it, it, it sort of amplifies the activations, right? And so if you do that, you would get something like this, where it's basically kind of exaggerating the features that it found in order to, um, well, you know, make more of them, right? And you see that this is finding these like psychedelic edges, right? And colors and stuff like that. And that's because this is one of the early layers, right? But you can do this actually at any layer and um, get different results. So, okay, so here's another example. So here it shows what happens if you select a different feature. So here it's like, okay, this is selecting one layer, maybe the early edges. And yeah, okay, these are all basically edges. But then if you go towards the middle, maybe, this is one of the middle layers, maybe the features are not edges anymore, but they're kind of like um, something a little bit more complicated. right? So that's really cool. Um, now, um, so yeah, you can just take clouds, an image of clouds, and then this is now using one of the later layers. And so now the images start to look really weird. They look kind of psychedelic, right? Like this thing comes from nowhere. So the metaphor that it was using, that we were using all the time was um, dreaming, hallucinating. And this is kind of what psychedelic drugs I th roughly do, right? Like, I mean, um, and you all know, of course, like it's, it's, no, the idea that this is true, right? This is, you can read about the physiology of this. Like you, you think you see something, and then your brain just makes more of it, and then you really, really start to see it. So it finds patterns, and, it, and then it enhances them. And those patterns are actually there, right? You're not making them up entirely. They're just there. They're just very, very quiet, and you just increase them. Yeah? Uh, about the layers you said, did, did you choose to optimize up an early layer while the neural network didn't go to later? Or did you just like, It stops at whatever layer you selected, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, um, so this is obviously like the, the metaphors, uh, uh, always of psychedelic drugs and dreaming and things like that. And there, it definitely is like, you know, like it's not, it's not made up. There's, there's definitely like an overlap there, I think. Um, now, yeah, so you see more examples of this. The horizon becomes pagodas and towers and then trees become buildings and leaves become birds and insects and it's really really cool so this is deep dream now then um that was a lot of alex mordvin stuff doing stuff and then his colleague here mike taika um really advanced this stuff even further so he started exploring he started doing um things like this so what's going on here here it's the same thing as before with deep dream but we go back to the original idea of just initializing the canvas with nothing, uh, with white noise. So, so before we had white noise and activate a particular neuron. And then Deep Dream was take an image and activate whatever it, whatever it happens to see. 
And then this is start with white noise again and activate whatever it is you see. Now this, this seems weird because you would think with white noise the neural network shouldn't see anything. But it sees a little bit of something. It always sees just a little bit of something because if you initiate random patterns, the activations are going to be un uneven with each other, right? There's going to be, they're all going to be very low because you have mostly noise and no signal, but something's going to be just a little bit higher by coincidence. And so if you apply this, this process, you'll make those slightly less low activations a little bit higher and you do this in the feedback loop and it'll gradually just bring out stuff, right? So here you're just turning white noise into just random hallucinations of stuff. And again, depending on which of the neurons you decide to select for, maybe a whole layer, maybe a subset of a layer, maybe multiple layers, you'll get stuff that looks like this, right? And so this is some of Mike Tyka's work. Um, and um, really just doing really crazy stuff. And so in 2015, they released a notebook, uh, like a Jupyter notebook. Uh, actually, this is, was it Jupyter? Yeah, it was a Jupyter notebook. Actually, back then it was called an IPython notebook. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, was it? I, yeah. So they released that and they put it online and then, and then the whole internet was just littered with deep dream. Like people deep dreaming everything. If you, if you go to, you know, your... Um, You know, it, the whole internet looked like this, right? That's Memo Acton. He's a artist that uses a lot of open framework stuff. I mean, just everywhere. And um, yeah, people making this crazy stuff like this. And and myself, I also was participating in this. It was really cool because it's like everyone was an artist. <laughs> That's just gnarly. Right? So, um, so that was Deep Dream. So I did some Deep Dream stuff. Um, this is a special place in India um, uh, that, that I used to go to a lot and I Deep Dreamed it. So all these cars, capsules, fireworks being turned into different things. This is using the, the original framework was written in, in, um, in cafe I think which which um, because this is before tensorflow even so this is this is um, yeah this is deep dream stuff that's me maybe if you can tell if you choose different layers you get different features so so like if you just I mean this is just like this is hideous right I mean I look like a werewolf um, so, so cool stuff, right? Um, yeah, Alex did a lot of stuff. He's just you know messing with this technique, um, Mike, and then this kind of led to uh, Distill actually. So Distill that pub is this really lovely blog um, or like a sort of journal that Chris Ola mostly writes. He was one of the Deep Dream guys, and he and they made um, an update to Deep Dream called Lucid, which I haven't used too much, but but Lucid is out there, and kind of like has some similar properties. It's a little bit more high level than Deep Dream, but it has some more features. Um, so that's something that maybe we'll take a look. So um, the thing that I became really interested in, and I added the notebook, and we're going to look at this notebook uh, basically coming up. We're almost um, almost at the end of the lecture, I think. Uh, just let me just check how much we have. Yeah, yeah. We're just. Uh, I know it looks like we have a lot of slides, but I'm just gonna show you a lot of eye candy, and then we're gonna get to the notebook. So the thing we're gonna show how to do is how to do deep dream. I'm gonna show you a notebook for doing deep dream, um, and I'm gonna show you some techniques that that and Mike explored these also, but I've been really interested in using and combining these with masks. So the whole process of deep dream is great is um, iterative. It's an iter it's an optimization. So it goes in iterations. So maybe you take an image of white noise and then you update it a thousand times. So um, the idea with masks is maybe you can get some interesting compositional effects by, um, by taking those gradients and, and modifying them before reapplying them. 
So like maybe you can mask the gradients. And by mask, I mean like, like the way you mean in Photoshop. You know, you can multiply the gradients by a number between zero and one so that you can get rid of some. And by gradients, I mean the difference in all the pixels. So the, change, the pixels all change a little bit. But what if you go, I'll only change the pixels in the center and all of the ones in the, on the outside, I'll, I'll um, you know, zero out. And then maybe then you're only changing the stuff in the middle. So you can get some interesting compositional effects. You can combine uh, multiple visualizations with masks and you get some interesting effects doing that. I'll show you how to do that. Um, and um, so you can do things like this. So this is some of the stuff that I did uh, like two years ago, I guess. And basically this is just uh, taking these, this deep dream idea and then combining multiple optimizations uh, with masks. So this is a mask that kind of goes from left to right. It's like a crossfade. And what's cool about it is that it's not really like a crossfade. Like a crossfade, you see a little bit of both things. But here it's actually like just a, it's not a crossfade. It's, a, it's, a, it's sort of like forced to optimize both things at the same time a little bit. You know, it's like a negotiation. Will I look more like this thing or more like this thing or somewhere in between? So this, you can get pretty interesting effects this way. Um, and you can apply the masks however you want. And the, the idea is that because of this masking approach, you take back a little bit of control. You know, maybe you're a visual artist and you're a little annoyed that Deep Dream just does everything for you, right? So, and that's kind of the, the thing that, you know, it automates so much of the composition. And this is a way of taking back some of that composition. Is there a, yeah. Oh, and then you can also make videos because the thing about Deep Dream is, of course, it takes in, it starts with an input image. Now that input image might be white noise, but the input image might also just be the last image that you make. So you can actually make a feedback loop where you make a new frame based on the previous frame and then you can generate videos this way. And so then there's even more compositional stuff that you can do by uh, taking the previous frame and maybe modifying it slightly, maybe rotating it, let's say, or zooming in a little bit. And that's, and that's how you can get some more compositional effects. You can, there's also other things you can do. Okay, so Deep Dream starts with initial images. So, okay, like maybe you can, instead of starting with white noise, you start in with white noise mixed with an image of something, like some, some person, let's say. And then, um, yeah, working to kind of modify that. Okay. So, just the blend, you know, wow. white noise with an actual photograph. You know. um, what if you just use it, the actual photograph without the white noise? Then you get something like Deep Dream. You know, I am th this this more or less is I mean, all same technique basically. But you, yeah. So I mean, it, um, all he did was um, kind of, he, you know, like let's say doing the deep dream thing except starting with white noise instead of starting with uh, an image of Ibises. Why he did the white noise? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, more video stuff, just eye candy. So this is the kind of stuff that you can make with this yeah, TensorFlow notebook. These are perfect loops, by the way. That's another thing. I have this online, the code for doing this, although it's not well documented. So, um, but if anyone's interested in this, I can tell you the secret sauce. It's not that secret, but. Um, okay, so then um, the other thing that, that hopefully we should have enough time to show both of these, at least uh, briefly, um, is style transfer. So um, the original style transfer uh, came along what was called style transfer. Uh, style transfer is kind of ambiguous now, but the original uh, idea behind style transfer uh, came out in just about a month after after Deep Dream in 2015, and it was mind blowing. Like for anyone who was following this at the time, no one had ever seen anything like this. Like a neural network takes an image like the Mona Lisa and regenerates it so that it looks like another image, you know, or so it looks like another style. So here it looks like Cuba style or Van Gogh style or Monet style, you know, all different images, like re superimposing the style of one image onto another. 
So this uh, was was also really mind blowing, and this is also advanced a lot. This is the original, so it looks you know it's not even that as good as it can be anymore. But um, but the the interesting thing is that the original style transfer was very very similar to Deep Dream in the way it worked. It was also an optimization based technique. And so first of all, how many people remember seeing this? Let's say 2015, 2016. Um, if you were if you were interested in this around then, I mean, in the last year or two, it's also remained. You know, you can kind of see this see see this in runway also. Um, the original idea for style transfer, kind of uh, riffing a little bit off of deep treatment. So it worked it worked in the following way. The original paper for this came out. Um, the author is Leon Gattis. This is made in Germany, in Tübingen, and this is the cover of the paper. They showed like. They took a picture of their university and see the nice German style architecture and imposed like different painting styles on them. Right, so here's Edvard Munch. It's a starry night. Starry night was always the, the go to. Um, and uh, so they described their technique. Um, oh, OK, so I do I have. Yeah, I have this here. OK, so the these are just like about i made these mona lisas and a whole bunch of different painting styles and you see it gener generalizes very nicely and all of these are kind of low pixel resolution but then a, a year or two later you could do it in very high resolution so that i can make things like um let's see if i can find that's the original one and then I'll show you how it looks now, like HD. I have an HD folder, high res. So stuff like, oh no, that's not right. Multi-scale. Yes, so you could do stuff like this. Right, look how this is really big. So this, I mean, this is not necessarily super easy to do because you do have to um the hardware limitations are, are kind of the main thing but before you could just do like really small and so now um yeah you can get incredible resolution incredibly incredibly high detail um it's really awesome so how does this work i'm going to give you the one minute version of how this works actually there's a very nice uh youtube channel called two minute papers um, which which has a video on this that that's worth checking out if you want to get like a better explanation of this than I'm about to give you, but um, and and actually you can also read the paper now I know that sounds like really imposing but if you more or less understand what I meant by how deep dream works then the paper should actually and you have decent linear algebra let's say um, then this paper is actually quite readable so by Liam Gattis it's like six pages long and the technique works like this. You have a trained convolutional neural network. Here's our covnet right there. And the covnet, whenever you send an image to it, it gives you a set of activations, right? So, so we start out with two images, called a content image, the Mona Lisa, and the style image, Starry Night. And we initialize a third image, which will be our output image. It's going to be, it will be eventually, Star, uh, Mona Lisa in the style of Starry Night. So all of these three images, and we started with white noise, let's say. All of these three images, we can, we can forward pass them through a neural network, and we can get a set of activations. So here's the activations for, for the Mona Lisa, set of activations for, neural style, uh, for Starry Night, and a set of activations for the white noise. And you see in the white noise, there's hardly any activations at all. <laughs> and then with Deep Dream, the idea was to change the pixels so as to optimize something. And Deep Dream, the optimization was the just basically having high activations in, in a particular neuron of interest or a whole layer or whatever your you know, whatever your thing is. You know, maybe maybe with Deep Dream it was whatever the activations are, just amplify them. In vis in neural visualization, it's just pick a neuron and, and optimize for that. Um, in style transfer, it's the same thing except the optimization is uh, is optimizing sli sli uh, something slightly more complicated and having to do with an interrelationship of these two, right? 
And the idea is that now we're optimizing, first of all, two different things at the same time. So we're up to, we, want, we want the output image to match the content of the content image and to match the style of the style image. And so these are actually two separate optimizations, right? And we can call, we can call one the content loss and we want the content loss to be low. And we can call, and the second one we call the style loss and we can call, and we can want the style loss to be low. And the content loss is, reflects how much the content, and we'll define that in a second, the content of the content image matches the content of the output image. And the style loss reflects how much the style of the style image is the same as the style of the output image. Now the content image is actually really, the content loss is actually really simple. All it is, is the difference between these and these, right? And that makes sense, right? The activations tell us content. It almost means the same thing, right? It's like the activations are featured feature extractors. They are content extractors, content being the stuff that's in the image, right? And so ideally to, to make this really low, these would be exactly the same as these, right? And of course they won't know if they were exactly the same, then, then we would have a replica of the content image, right? But we're trying to balance that with also a style, uh, minimizing a style loss. Yeah? Which layer is this? Uh, it, so that's also something that in principle is, it, you, is a hyperparameter that you, that you choose. So I can so, imagine like, I, I, noticed that, I noticed that it tends to have the overall, I noticed that like when you do this with the Mona Lisa, you tend to get something that has the overall shape of the Mona Lisa. She's still in the same position. Versus when you do deep dream with a banana, you get banana. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. So I'm wondering, like, that has to have something to do with which layers you involve in this. Yeah. Thing. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, even it, it, it almost if you choose any layer, uh, it should put her in roughly the same place because because now location does matter, mm -hmm. but um, but. But yeah, in, in principle, like like the the original paper, it, it selected some of the layers, and then you can actually weight the layers differently. There's all sorts of degrees of freedom here, okay. but that's but that's yeah one of them. Then now the style loss is actually really is really interesting, and and again like you know this this is one of those things that might fly over your head, but but you read it enough times and it'll make sense. So the way so the way that the style loss works is we're not trying to get a, a, a subtraction of these two exactly. The style loss is, is encapsulated by the, in the following way. Uh, first, these activations, we extract what's called a gram matrix. And the gram matrix is a matrix which contains the correlation between every pair of activation maps. So let's say there's a hundred activation maps, then the correlation and correlation is, is, is a dot product. Basically, it's just a, it's a statistical thing, correlation, right? Um, it's the core, it's the correlation of every pair of them. So that gives you something called the gram matrix and it's position in bar And now the space spatially doesn't matter anymore because it all gets condensed and just gets summed together into a correlation statistic. And you do that for both the output image and the, and the style image. And then you try to get these two to be exactly the same. I mean, not exactly the same, but as close to the same as possible. And that gives you the style loss. And magically, it's a really, really great measure of um, style loss. Although it turns out that basically it, it can be any statistic, more or less, of the, that captures these. There's been a lot of work in this. But something like that, yeah roughly and has some level of correlation built into it. So this gives you two separate loss functions, a content loss and the style loss. And then the thing that you're optimizing for is the sum is a weighted sum of them. So the it's weighted because maybe we care about one or the other more. They're in they're in neutral conflict. You can't optimize both at the same time. Um, obviously because if you optimized for content loss you would get the exact same image as the content image. Uh, if you optimize for style loss, you would get the exact same image as a style. So um, ultimately, it has to optimize for both uh, both of them, 
and you have these weights like an alpha and the beta which is your weight which one you care about more and this is actually important because you'll see that 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 you can get interesting different effects if you optimize for one or the other more um, and then and so then that leads us to an update rule which is uh, a gradient descent rule so here's our learning rate gamma we we figure out the with the um, the gradient of the loss function with respect to all of the pixels of the output image and so if you do this and you apply I thought I had a oh it's a video yeah you can see that it slowly converges on yeah spent a good solid day in 2016 making this <laughs> like making this little visual um, and so lo and behold you get Mona Lisa in the style of the star in the style of Starry Night. Yep. Um, so I made this in 2015, and this was I think it was the first. Video. I'm not 100 percent sure of this, but I think it was the first style transfer video. In any case, like you can see, it was super low resolution. This is uh, Alice in Wonderland being restyled in a whole bunch of different painting styles. Super low resolution, but it it was it made a splash and it was pretty it was pretty fun like make watching the reaction because nowadays this is all old news, but um, at the time like this is a really technique that you would need like a thousand uh, you know well well paid animators to do, and then suddenly it's like one person with a with with a gpu can make this and so that was kind of the you can see it's really noisy i i did it like because each frame is being made independently the only way i could figure out how to make it less noisy was by tr trying to blend the output into the input of the next frame and you know that works kind of okay now we can actually do this on video which is really which is really cool um but yeah that's kind of so more videos this is like style transfer on gustav klimt when you say now we can do it on video there's something that, that avoids that noise yeah you're and actually doing, i you're not I, doing it frame by frame anymore. yeah so this is more examples um style transfer mirror by the way i've 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 may i've had this i made this style transfer mirror the original i called the cubist mirror and i've had this installed in like more than anything i've ever installed like i've combined like this has been like my my uh what do you what would you call it my lifeblood i don't know like it's really supported me like a lot over the years which has been uh really nice so um now okay so here's something cool so here this looked kind of like deep dream right it's like google maps hallucination now this um the uh, all this is yep What do you mean, content loss plus content? That's yeah, just like, content like loss. You're, like, like combining two images. Like you start with white noise and you try to minimize um, similarity to two different other images. I mean, if you really did that, all all it would do would just like make a crossfade of them, probably. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, probably. Not. But, well, okay. So, but this does something interesting. So here, what happens here? This is this is style transfer, but it looks like there's no content. And the reason why there's no content is because all you do is you take this formula and you go alpha is zero. So alpha and beta control how much you care about, how much you optimize for content loss versus how much you optimize for style loss. Well, here's something funny. What if you just, now, okay, if you, if you make beta zero and then you optimize for content loss, then it's just going to recreate the same image. Uh, it won't necessarily recreate the same image, but something close to it, I think. It would be a good experiment. Someone should try that. But um, but if you optimize for only style loss, then the content there is no content reconstruction. It doesn't care about content reconstruction. It would basically say, yeah, you want the Mona Lisa, but there's you're not going to see any Mona Lisa. You'll just see Starry Night features. So if you do that, you get what's called texture synthesis. Although texture synthesis could mean different things also, technically. But um, but you you basically get like a sort of 
something like this, you know, hallucinating Google map like things. Um, there's a, a good friend of mine named Sof Sophia Crespo who does a lot of this texture synthesis stuff. She's made a lot of awesome stuff. Some of her work. And I have been, um, this is already a little old, but I, I have this loop technique that I've used for Deep Dream. So here, this is like the Google Maps of your nightmares, you know, <laughs> just like zooming in on your phone and it never gets anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. One, one. So, I mean, th this is a funny thing because you're not training anything. Yeah. So you, you already have a trained neural network mm -hmm. and it's been trained on millions of images, right? To do, to do something completely different. It's been trained to do classification. But the point is that those activation maps, you can use them um, to tell you about how close the styles are of two images. And actually a really funny paper came out maybe one year after this, which basically said that you can get style transfer that works the same, even if you took a CubeNet, which hasn't been trained. If you take a convolutional neural network and, and, and initialize it with random weights, you can still do style transfer, um, which is really cool. And the reason why that kind of works, it's a little hard to explain, but it, it's, um, it's similar to the way that you can replace PCA with random multiplication into like a lower dimensional space. The point is that the, the, the actual features don't matter. The point is the correlation between features. So the features can be random. As long as the features are correlated with each other, you know that, you, that you know the two things correspond in style, roughly speaking. Now maybe if it's trained, it might look slightly better, but not by much. So. Correlation, um, it's really simple. Like it's just a dot. I mean, there's a few ways of doing it. Like it's basically just a dot product. Um, yeah, correlation, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's just a dot product that's normalized. You can look like this. Uh, this is, you know, it's like something. No, the, the simplest way is this, I guess. You know, it's just like you take two vectors and then you normalize them and then you basically just take a dot product of the point for point. So when the big numbers are, when both, if big numbers are, uh, if on both vectors, like the big numbers are, you have big times big plus small times small, you'll get a high correlation. Big times small plus, plus small times big, if they don't line up, you'll just get zeros. So you get small correlation. Something, that's, that's kind of the... Um, or another, another um, you can also do it with, by measuring the angle between them, between the two vectors. So things like that. Okay, so I'm running a little long in the first half, so let me, let me close this up and then we'll do the notebooks after. So more texture synthesis stuff. This is like stuff that you can do. So you can take just one image, you know, here I took Kandinsky and you can, you can do this style. So there's nothing trained exactly here. Now later, someone figured out a way to, the, the thing is this, this works iteratively. So every frame has to be generated one at a time with a thousand iterations through a, of a forward pass through a neural network and, it's, and it uses optimization to optimize the pixels. But that takes a really long time. And so ideal, maybe we could do this faster. And the way to do it faster is by training a neural network to actually do this, right? And then this is where we start to get into more generative model territory. So we'll kind of not cover that today, but uh, then you actually do need more images. Although you still only use one, one target image, but I'll, I'll explain that next week, I think. Is it just zooming here? Like you, you generate the first frame. Generate first zoom frame, a zoom a little, yeah, crop and it. that becomes the speed of that. Yeah. Exactly, and maybe rotate it. And there's all you could distort it. There's all sorts of stuff you could do. There's a lot of like uh, really cool things. So this is the blackboard of your nightmare. Right? It's just a random like I searched chalkboard on on Google Images, and I found something I liked. Some beautiful physics chalkboard, and then just generate like. Wait, where is the watermark? Like, 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I've never thought of that before, but I don't know if I quite see what you mean. Really? Wait, let me pause it. Where do you see it? Maybe this kind of right there. Oh. You're right. Oh yeah. Oh, that's so, that's so that's very that's a nice pickup. I never noticed that before. You're right. Yeah, it is capturing it. So, um, if I try to describe the technique right now without showing you visuals, it, it'll be confusing. But but okay. So I'll I'll try to roughly say, say it. So each frame is produced from the output of the previous frame. So let's say you want to make a three second loop. So you make the first frame and then the second frame is based on the first frame and then the third frame is based on the second frame and all the way until you get to the 90th frame because let's say it's 90 frames, three seconds. And then the 90th frame is based on the 89th frame. So then, and, and I'm sure there's a much smarter way of doing this, like uh, any deep learning person would probably hate this. This is super hacky, but this is the way that I figured out how to do it. Um, is then, okay, then I make the first frame based on the 90th frame, right? So then I go in the loop. Basically, I will make the first frame based on, I will overwrite the previous first frame with a new one based on the 90th. Now, that, that by itself, that doesn't quite work because you always have a discontinuity wherever you stop, right? So if I, now I have a new first frame, and so the second frame doesn't, doesn't look like the first frame. So, but the, the, the way that this works is that instead of always going from the previous frame, I slowly, gradually change it from being not from the previous frame, but from the next frame. So it'll be, it'll be, the first frame will be from the 90th, but then, but then I have, but then it'll actually be a weighted sum of the previous frame and the, the next frame. And so first it's all previous frame and zero next frame. But then I gradually, as I go, I do this multiple rounds, I gradually change the weight so that it's more from the next frame than from the previous frame. And you give it sort of time to, to kind of like take a little bit of both the next and the previous frame. And then eventually it just, you, you end up reproducing every frame like multiple times which makes it take a really, really long time. That's why, that's why I think it's, you know, there must be a way of doing it all in one. If you optimize it as a loop to begin with, which I'm sure you can, but I don't know how, um, then it, it smooths, it smooths it out somehow. Um, so yeah, this, this was a, a thing I played with, but I, I want to keep going cause we're kind of running long. So more, more texture synthesis. These are collages. So you can, another cool thing you can do with style transfer or texture synthesis is you can use multiple style images and then simply um, you can you can actually like as many as you want you can basically average their gram matrices and then that gives you a, a, a style a style representation which is multiple images at the same time so you can take like for example all of Frida Kahlo's work or not all of it but like 20 paintings I found and then this is a collage of all of those paintings kind of and you see that you know Frida Kahlo liked to paint herself a lot, so there's a lot of random loose eyes and eyebrows and noses and stuff. Um, this is what Dali, uh, what Pollock looks like, right? Um, Salvador Dali, and you know you get different. George O'Keefe always painted flowers, so it's just like flowers. Um, this is a cool thing that uh, that it, like Alex is always like one step ahead of the curve. Like he does amazing stuff. He's an actual scientist. So here he did this thing for Nip, Nips last year or two years ago where, um, well, okay, you can watch this, it's just great. So basically you're zooming in and then it zooms in on some painting. I think I basically know how he does this. I think it's kind of similar to what I have, but um, way, way cooler, right? So then get this painting, now zoom in again, and it'll get to a different painting. So that's pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, because because that's an artifact of, you know, like the, at some point he's superimposing like one, the actual image into the, into the output. And yeah. So yeah, that, that is visible. Uh, they also like in Distill, there's a blog post about this where they figured out like they did all sorts of extensions of style transfer in Deep Dream. One that they did was putting it on, on a 3D object because when you generate uh, just an image, it has, it has an end, right? But what if you want to put it around the 3D object? Well, then are you going to have a scene somewhere where it ends and you know you sort of wrap it? Here, they actually figured out a way to just optimize all the pixels so that it's a seamless texture. Um, so that's also like a really cool thing that they did. Okay, so we're going to do these demos in the second half. We'll take a break now. And, um, and then I'm going to show you, I'm going to try to show a, like, all, I think actually we can show all of these things. Like the paper space thing will be kind of like very superficial, but the main thing we'll do is the neural synth notebook. So um, let's take a break and let's come back here in seven and a half minutes. Uh, let's say let's say five oh five. Yeah. Okay. Next thing we'll do is the following. So um, we're gonna. I want to show you a few things. I want to show you this. Um, the first thing I'll do is this visual importance thing, just because it's kind of it'll take like one second and it's in runway, so I can get some runway stuff in here. Um, and then we'll do the neural synth notebook. And then I'll probably, uh, that will take that will take the most, the glut of the rest of today. I'm gonna show you this neural synthesis, this deep dream notebook. And then I'll do a really quick paper space tutorial. Paper space has sort of become less necessary for, for the class uh, because, uh, well, because we have other tools, although it still is kind of the easiest way to just get a computer and start trying to do stuff on the GPU. Um, now, of course, like we'll also, we also have HPC, and we have, um, we have, um, what do you call it? Uh, um, the machine over here. And actually, um, Dan Oved is going to give a HPC tutorial, um, which everyone should really, I encourage you all to check that out. Um, HPC is the high performance compute cluster. It's a, it's a way to get resources for training your models if you want to do that. And, um, and it's really uh, like a ninja thing about having, being a student here at NYU, you have access for the duration of time that you're students um, to this you know, amount of compute. And you can really do a lot of stuff in there. It's, there's a little bit of getting used to, like if you're, um, if you're uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but it, it's, it's pretty reasonable. And I'm actually going to be gone. Uh, the, he's going to do that on October 11th for AI Lab. I will be gone for that, so that'll be a good thing that you guys can can do to get your feet wet while I'm gone. And um, so yeah, I encourage you all to do that. Now I think we mentioned like on for, uh, that that will be for AI Lab and not for this. Um, although actually, a thought occurs to me that we maybe I could ask him to do it as like an extra class. I wonder. That's an interesting idea. Hmm. Let's, let's look into that. AI Lab is on Fridays. Now, right now I've had them all at three, but I think all of you don't like that. Uh, most of you uh, 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 prefer five. And I told the people at AI Lab that maybe we'll just start doing it at five. Uh, yeah? Sorry, uh, three. Uh, but yeah, what about, what if it was at five? How many people here can do things that now this this is not HPC class is not required but um, it's just a nice thing in the spirit of the class. How many of you could do something at at Fridays at five? Anybody not able to do things Friday at five? We have? Oh really? Friday Friday at five. Both three and five. Yeah. Oh, your class, class is from three to s oh, this class is from three to six. <laughs> yeah, um, it's like that all the time. Uh, let me quickly uh, let me just erase the, this. Oh, this is so so ad hoc. Okay. Um, 
this is going to be done in seven minutes, which means I should get enough space back that this recording works. So, man. Okay. So, hmm. Maybe maybe that might be actually good. Let me. I'll ask Dan. I'll, I'll ask Dan if he if he might be interested. I don't know if he's available, but that's the thing because he, I think, is expecting you for AI lab. But okay, we'll 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 get back to that. Okay. So anyway. Um, so let's, and then, yeah, and I'll show you paper space. And paper space is still useful, so I think it's kind of a good thing to have. Let me quickly show you something really nice in Runway, which is this visual importance repository. Um, let me also pop this up. Okay, so visual importance is a library uh, that shows you, that visualizes what are the most salient, let's say the most important parts of an image are. If you look for visual importance, you'll find, uh, oh, maybe not, okay, visual importance, what is it? Should be in the, oh, maybe it's just not in the popular. Visual, yeah, visual importance. So this will show us, it's a really small thing I wanna show you, remember? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, how to use uh, runway stuff? Okay, so here's the visual importance demo. I actually already have one here. So let's go to visual importance, and then we'll choose the camera. Oh, it's not going to give me the camera because I'm using it to record. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Well, for those of you who are on runway. If you chose mine, mine isn't gonna work right now because I don't think it's gonna work. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's just that it's. It used to not have a problem doing this, but for some reason it's not. It doesn't like sharing the camera with ScreenFlow. So fine. Like, uh, but you know what? Let's let's actually just use like a, a file. So I'm gonna pick a file instead of the camera, and I'm gonna try to find the image that's not like too personal, I guess, I don't know. Um, screenshots are not ideal. Let's go to my pictures library. Playing with fire here, really. <laughs> um, no, I think that's me. Oh. Uh, okay, fine. Doesn't like images that are too big. Um, can take something like this. Okay run remotely. So this will take this image, this is from the Fifurium, this is a museum in Berlin that I just made an installation in, and it'll tell us what's important about the image. Camera works pretty well too, it'll mostly, you know, highlight people in it. Um, so, but the, okay, so while it's doing this, I'll explain what it's doing. It's basically highlighting the extent to which all the pixels contributed to the classification, uh, to the accuracy of, to the, uh, to the model um, making its decision, let's say. So it's kind of this visual saliency. Saliency being like, what's the, what's the part of the image that contributed the most to the classification? So, and you can kind of, con you can kind of uh, associate that with some measure of importance, right? Um, so that's, that's the basic idea. Depending on how big the image is, this might actually take a while. So I'll maybe just kind of like come back to this. But, but if you run it on the camera, it should be, it should be relatively responsive. Um, it takes the longest just to start the model. But just remember that you have Runway, there's like, I would encourage you all to be looking through Runway because like Runway is a really easy way to see what's, what's in the ecosystem. So maybe Runway may not be able to fit your needs if you want to design some really complicated app that, that you know, Runway doesn't accommodate for all the features that you need. But it is definitely a really fast way of being able to see the landscape of all the models that are available in GitHub. And that's, and that's great because then you can kind of, 
you know, you don't have to set anything up, you don't have to install anything, you can just get a sense of what things do. And so I would encourage you to be using Runway. And uh, so yeah, you can see that like the person here, this is a friend of mine lit up. The this is maybe not the, the ideal subject matter for the, for this, but, but you get the idea, right? So like the subject, the front, the, it's also a nice sort of front um, background foreground uh, differentiation model. So that's kind of nice as well. Um, okay, so that's all I wanted to show from Runway today. There's other things in Runway that are that are useful. We'll probably use it a little bit more when we get into generative models, but um, but for today I want to show you this neural synth notebook. It, the model is called Visual Importance, and I actually right, forgot. It's, it's saying this is this contributed to classification of our model. Oh, um, that's a good question. So we can find out if we. If we look at the code, I think it's probably this. Um, most likely, it's just some pre-trained model. Initialize user pre-trained VOC FCM. You can look it up. I mean, it's some pre-trained model for something. Most likely classification, but I actually haven't looked into it, so I don't know. Oh, here's the website. This is made at MIT. The internet is a little bit weak, but but okay. I'll let that kind of slide. Actually, if the internet is weak, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> I'm about to use stuff from the internet. Maybe just their website is bad. Let's see. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so it, the next thing I want to show you is. ML for a. If you go to ML, this this I'd like for everyone to do. We're gonna follow this along. I'm gonna do a quick tutorial of a CoLab notebook that I have that everyone can use. Is everyone's internet like working kind of okay? Yeah. So if you go to ML for a.github.io and then you find um, and then you go to guides. And then you, I really hope this finishes soon, because I think we're getting to the, to the breaking point. Let me just see if I need to pause it, because if I don't pause it at the right time, I'm going to lose it. Oh, actually, that's not so bad. We're kind of fine right now. All right, good. All right, so if you go to the guides and you do a search for uh, neural, but uh, that's probably not good, not neural, uh, neural synth. Ne you'll see a guide that looks like this called neural synthesis. <coughs> and you'll see that there's some psychedelic looking graphics on it. Right? How to visualize neural networks, in the, how to visualize features in the trained neural net, recreating deep dream, masking, distorting the canvas and video feedback. You guys found it? I want you to go ahead and click on that and that will take you to Colab. And Colab, as you should know, is by now is a, I mentioned it a couple times earlier. Uh, oh, there's new features. New editor to try and enhance code completions. Another new feature is you can opt out at any time. That's kind of neat. Um, I just don't want it to confuse me right now, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'll just say no thanks for now. So, um, the Colab, note, Colab is a service by Google that lets you execute code remotely and use their computers to execute it and send you back the results. It's basically Jupyter Notebook, except it uses a remote server that's hosted by Google. And it's, um, yeah, that's, that's more or less what it is. It, when you open this for the first time, you'll see on, underneath Neurosynth PYMB, you'll see something that says open in playground, right? Unless you've already copied it, you probably see open in playground. Yeah, is that correct? So click open in playground. And from there you also, um, if you wish, and I would just say you can go ahead and do this, like you can also, uh, I think, save a copy in your own Google Drive. Um, and there's nobody here without a Google account, right? Of course not. Really? That's interesting. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Using NYU uses Google for email. Hmm. 
Anyway, um, so yeah, I would just save it to your, your Google Drive and you'll have a copy of it, which means that if you make modifications to it, they, you'll save them because otherwise you would just be looking at a, at a read-only copy of my notebook or read and, read and, and execute, but no, no writing privileges. So um, please go ahead and do that. And then um, you should see this. Everyone see that? Yeah. So um, I encourage you all to, to read through the text later. Actually, it's mostly a recap of what we've already talked about today. So here you've already seen these. This is just doing some, this describes a little bit of the history of this visualization technique. And then um, we've already done at least one notebook, if I recall, right? So we have we coasted through this? No, we haven't? Okay. Has anyone not used the Colab or um, or Jupyter notebooks? Okay, so let me let me do a quick description of. Um, sometimes I get confused in my head of what I covered in class and what I covered in AI Lab, because we did a Colab notebook in AI Lab for sure, I think. <coughs> but okay, so Colab and notebooks in general are this uh, way of. Um, it's kind of this recent way of uh, a, co a sort of code execution environment in which um, we use these notebooks. And notebooks consist of cells. These cells are, you can see that when you highlight one cell, it changes the focus. So cells are blocks of either code or markdown. Markdown being like um, just text. So markdown is like the kind of stuff that Wikipedia is edited with. Um, HTML is a type of markdown. Basically, it's just a way of rendering text for writing out notes. And uh, so some of the cells are notes. So the, these are just notes. These are written in Markdown. And then this right here is code. And um, the code uh, blocks, uh, actually all of them, but, but the code blocks more relevantly have this play button next to them. You see this play button? So when you press the play button, it executes, uh, it executes the code on Google servers and then sends you back the results and um, writes them out in a, like a console right below the text box and it holds all of the memory so it's like an interactive code console we can create variables you know we can make expressions we can do computations and all the results stay in this environment it's like using a Python shell except except um, the the actual execution is being done somewhere else so um, the cost of surveillance, or the, the benefits of surveillance. More or less. So now um, the, the reason why we're doing it this way is because the neural synth notebook uses some convolutional neural networks and you just can't run it locally. It, it, none of our computers, including mine, um, have it except for maybe that one right there. Um, and uh, I think that's all really. That's a nice gamer laptop, right? Yeah, so you could probably run some of this stuff locally, which you, which you may consider doing. Uh, but most of the stuff just won't run um, on our laptops, on our um, puny MacBooks. Um, so uh, we instead off, uh, outsource that to Google, and it's kind of nice because all of the installation has already been handled for us. So we don't have to worry about libraries or anything. We can just run code. And so it makes it a nice teaching tool, especially with the notes and stuff. And so this notebook I made is basically kind of, it's, it's basically built, it's based on the TensorFlow Deep Dream example, which you can find online. I think I have a link to it here. Um, there's a link in the text to, to the original notebook. So it's basically that plus a bunch of stuff that I mentioned earlier, like the masks and everything. And um, I'm going to show you how to, how to use it to make these Deep Dream images. So the first cell here, you'll see that has code in it. It says grab inception model from online and unzip it. Um, I want you to to take to hit this button and hit it once. Um, just hit it once because it will do some stuff basically. So first it'll take a little while to connect, initialize, and once you're connected, it'll start to run it. And what this block is doing, ironically, this this block is the only block that runs code that's not actually Python code. Um, this is all a Python shell. But these exclamation marks, it's a clever way for, for the notebooks to let you run terminal commands. So this is running inside of a terminal, some remote terminal, and this is running some commands to download 
the inception model and store it in a local folder. Uh, not local on our computer, but local to the, to the machine that's executing it. The thing that it's downloading is, an, is a model trained by Google a few years ago to do image classification called Inception. And the, all the Deep Dream stuff is based on it. So, um, so we're just downloading it. Uh, all of us are downloading our own copy of it. So um, it should be pretty quick. So once you see archive inflating inflating, you, you'll be done. Um, one thing I should mention before we run the other cells is that occasionally like Colab is, you know, it's you get what you pay for which and you don't pay anything for it. So occasionally it'll do things like disconnect um, and you'll lose all your stuff and you just have to start over. It's kind of an annoyance, but like I said, you get what you pay for. Um, actually, uh, I think I want to say there's rumors that Google, that Google is going to make Colab a pay, per pay service soon. So, you know. So, well, maybe it'll become more reliable at that point. But anyway, um, so and if, if that happens, it can be a little confusing because you'll see, like, you might not notice even that it's disconnected until one of your variables, like, isn't found anymore. And then you have to go back to the beginning of the notebook. So there's ways around that. You can save stuff as you go, and, you know, but, but you know, just look out for that. Yeah? Uh, no, it's not your local computer. It's the machine that your um, it's it's the it's basically your RAM and disk monitor for Colab. So you're using Google's remote servers, and you might actually be running more than one Colab notebook at the same time. And Google doesn't let you, you know, it'll it, it gives you a quota for obviously like you know how much of their RAM that you can use at any given time. It's kind of enough to run one notebook reliably at a, at a time. Um, and um, same for the disk usage. And the model is downloaded to that. Yeah, okay. it's not downloaded to your local computer, right? We're we're from here on we're in a remote computer. <laughs> so um, the next cell right here has all these import statements. Is this really small? Maybe I should make it a bit bigger. Can you all see that? I mean, you all have your own local copy, so it shouldn't it doesn't need to be too big. So. Um, all of these import statements are importing a whole bunch of libraries that we need and we do not need to install ourselves because they've already been installed remotely. And so just go ahead and click that, the play button, and it'll circle around and it, there won't be any output here. So um, just make sure you did that and you should be able to proceed. So what that did is it just gave us a whole bunch of these Python libraries that we need. Um, oh, let me also... Go ahead and close this and uh, let me just quickly make sure that this all goes to plan. So I trash that. And now in theory, um, I should get all of my memory back. Hooray. Okay, so that, that should keep us good. Okay, so, so now the next thing is uh, this next cell block right here where it starts model FN. Just run that and I'll explain what it's doing while it's running. Just go ahead and run it and you can scroll to the bottom. And you should see that at the bottom of this cell there's a whole bunch of definitions of functions. And it'll say something like number of layers, 59. Total number of visual feature channels, 75, 48, something like that. Um, what that just did, this whole um, cell block, first of all, it loads the model that we downloaded and it, it declares a whole bunch of Python functions that we're going to be using in this notebook that do a bunch of stuff that we don't want to bother implementing. We're kind of using things at a high level, so we're leaving all the Deep Dream stuff aside to all the TensorFlow stuff in here. So you can look through this stuff if you want. It's not for the faint of heart. It's a bunch of TensorFlow Deep Dream stuff. I didn't write it. All of this stuff comes from the original TensorFlow Deep Dream notebook, um, plus a couple of convenience functions that I added to it. And it basically just loads the model and it initializes all the functions that we need. And we can kind of like be users on top of it. So in the next cell block, what this will do, it, it, the output is already here, but it's good to just redo it. 
So if you run this, it'll go blank and then print all of this out. You could do this as many times as you want. Um, all this is doing is that it there's we have this um, variable called layers, and layers lists all the layers of the Inception network. And what this prints for us is the name of each layer and the number of neurons it has. So you can see that uh, there's a whole bunch of layers. Each of them have, you know, or, or on the order of 100 neurons. And there are uh, 59, I think, yeah, 59 layers. And if you add all of these up, there's about 7,500 neurons. So that's what we're dealing with. And this right here is a really useful lookup table because we're going to be referencing the names of the layers. Uh, and also we need to know how many um, neurons are in each layer. And so that's going to be all useful for us. Um, now I'm actually going to skip the, the next few slides because the way this notebook works is that it builds up the deep dream method from the simplest, the naive way, all the way to the, to the way that deep dream actually does it. Um, with, which uses this multi-scale rendering and Laplacian normalization. You can look those things up. Laplacian normalization is basically, um, I'll describe it, we won't actually do the examples. So what Render Naive does, and I, again, I'm going to avoid kind of going too deep into the code because it's TensorFlow code and it's pretty ugly. Actually, TensorFlow just came out with a um, 2.0 version and Keras is actually very strongly integrated into it now. So TensorFlow is becoming like slowly more readable. This is still old TensorFlow. Um, oh, in fact, I hope I hope it still <laughs> runs um, because they just released new TensorFlow. I wonder if the collab actually has. Um, in fact, let me figure that out right now. Um, TF dot version. Okay, good. Uh huh? Sorry. Ah, yes. I just did a magic trick. So. Um, so from any cell, you see there's a menu here, and you can actually click in the little triplets here. And Oh, wait, what did I do? I forgot. Oh, no, no, it's, it's right here. You see there's a plus code plus text. So you can create a new cell block that has code. Print hello world. So you can write code here, and then you can run this code. Right. No, um, so you execute cells in whatever order you want, which means it needs to make sense. So, so it's uh, when you execute a cell, it doesn't execute the ones above it. You have to do each one individually, which means you can go out of order if you want. Now, if you go out of order and use a variable before you declared it, it's going to give you an error. Yeah, that's one thing about notebooks that people I think is confusing for people who learn it the first time. It actually technically doesn't matter. The order is just for you, is for reading. Okay. Um, but all the shells are affecting others. The, the results are in the So the, the results are like all of the cell blocks only contain code. Mm -hmm. The actual, your workspace, like what the values of different variables are, <clears throat> that's just sort of, you always have that, right? So if you change it, the variable using one cell, then that's the variable state. So then when you run a new cell block, it'll, it'll, it'll run with, in accordance to whatever the data happens to be. Yeah. So this render naive, it does basically what the original paper that I showed you does. It makes those really, you know, kind of ugly looking visualizations that show a little bit of those features, but not very much. Um, and the way it does it is using an iterative gradient descent that changes the pixels of the image so as to maximize the, um, the, uh, the score, we can call it here, T-score. Basically, it's trying to reduce the distance between the, um, pick the, feet, the activations and the desired activations. So, and then it does it iteratively right here. So we don't have to go too deep into the code. That's what it does. If you, if you declare this function and then run this cell, this shows you how to use it you'll get something like this, right? And the way that this cell block works, I, I'm gonna avoid executing it just because I wanna, um, I wanna go to where it becomes better looking. Um, but you would basically, if you wanna change which 
which layer or feature that you try to visualize, you basically change the name of the layer, right? So this comes from one of these, and then the index of the neuron or channel, in this case, channel, neuron, it's a little interchangeable. Um, these, make sure that this channel does not exceed how many channels are in this layer. And you can look this up, mixed 4D, 5X5. So here's mixed 4X, 5X5, bottleneck, pre-relu. So this has 32, which means that they go from zero to 31. So the maximum you can choose is 31. So if you tried to choose 35, then this would, this would uh, throw you in error. So, and it would break your computer, so be care really careful. Um, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Channel neuron. Um, uh, the way sometimes it calls it a channel because you have like in one convolutional layer you'll have yeah, these filters are they're kind of giving you channels. You know, like channels of a new act, like a like you know we use channels to mean the red, green, and blue channels of an image. Right. But in this case, it's kind of like the the feature A, feature B, feature C, feature D channels of a new activation volume. Okay, so it's one of those. By executing it, okay. yeah. Oh, there is like you can go online and you know they've been pre-rendered. So like there is a link somewhere. I think, I think there is a link in the notebook somewhere for gallery of examples. Yeah. Oh no, that's just my gallery. So there's like a. I think if you go to the original notebook, I think there's a link to it there. Um. Oh, there's a TensorFlow 2 version now. That's interesting. No, there isn't. Well done, guys. Um, hmm, I'm curious about this. I bet I can find it with Google. Hmm, I'll have to look at this. It does seem they have made some changes to it, maybe. Poor, poor dog. <laughs> oh, yeah. This looks a little bit different. Not by much, though. But I may have to update mine at some point. Um, okay. Fair enough. So now let's go back to my notebook. And yeah, I, I, I went here because I thought they had in a gallery. Oh yeah, here. Oh, but not, not this one. It should be Inception Gallery. Yeah, oh, the Lynette, yeah. So these, this like, okay, if you wanna see what all of the neurons look like, you can pick one of the layers. These are the same layers, and then I just these are in order. But we'll get to that. Um, so anyway, if you go back to the for the list of the neurons, the bottleneck pre-value and like five times five times three. Does that mean anything? Yeah, um, they're just names, but basically, like the if you look at the inception architecture, there's kind of like layers are grouped a little bit. The architecture of Inception is really complicated. It's not quite like what we saw where there's just one layer and then one layer and one layer. There's kind of like concurrent layers that then get recombined. So that's why there's this sort of like this master index. The 3x3 or 5x5 refers to the um, the size of the filters. So some fil sometimes the filters are 5x5, five five, sometimes they're 3x3. Three three. Um, some of them are pooling layers. Uh, the whole I'm not sure what bottleneck is supposed to mean exactly. Maybe um, pre-relu means it comes before one of the one of the relu layers, which is the the or, or rel, relu is not a layer, but it's basically like a nonlinearity to the to the, added to the activation. Like a sigmoid is one, and relu is another one. We introduced relus like in week two, but we didn't talk about them too much. But for our purposes, like the main thing to understand is that the early ones. 
your you know threes and fours, mostly abstract features, and the later ones are five. They're they're more complicated, high level features. So this is what that looks like, and then the next cell will takes render naive, and it it um, creates this multi scaling approach. We only have twenty five minutes left. How did this happen? I think well I think. Okay, I, I think what I'll, what I'll end up doing is I, that should give me enough time to get through this notebook. The paper space stuff will just save for next week. And so that's fine because I thought that'll be a good way to lead into generative models. Anyway, um, uh, okay, so yeah, the render multiscale is the same as naive except it uses multiscaling. So what is this multiscaling thing? So instead of just doing gradient descent on the original image and modifying the pixels that way, it does this technique where it'll initialize a blank, you know a white noise image and it'll do this naive thing on that image and then it'll actually use some upsampling technique like whatever simple upsampling by cubic whatever upsample it to a higher resolution and then do the same thing the naive thing on the on the higher on this higher resolution image so when you do that you take the original things that it found with naive and you blow them up so that so that whatever it created you just artificially make them bigger but then the the convolutional filters they they don't change size at all they stay the same size and so you're if you do this multiple times you're kind of bringing out features at multiple resolutions right so the original ones become the biggest and then you know the, the last one is is still the same sort of size as, as render naive because the convolutional filters they don't change but but you uh, but the image that you're producing does and this somehow works better like it ends up it ends up looking more like this now if you look at this you can still you can see that there's a much more content than in this but what you still see is that there's still all this like high frequency noise so the colors are really really like um it, it looks like a tv freaking out right it's kind of like uh su super so by high frequency we mean that the may the pixels change color very frequently like very like neighboring pixels will have the different colors there's there's almost no continuity and so um and, and there's a high degree of contrast. So this technique from computer vision called um, uh, called Laplacian normalization fixes this. And this is kind of where um, uh, where Deep Dream leaves off. So basically, this render lap norm takes the multiscaling and then it attaches this Laplacian normalization. You can look up Laplacian normalization if you want. It's it's basically this thing that kind of, it's this multi-scaling computer vision technique that tries to get rid of high frequency noise. As far as I understand, I don't know it too well. Um, but lo and behold, this render lap norm function, this is basically what the Deep Dream notebook in TensorFlow terminates with. And it produces the images that are, that we more or less know as Deep Dream. So you can, if you want to, uh, this render lap norm function, you can execute it. That just declares the function. So now we have access to a function called render lap norm. And now we go down to the next cell. And what you can do is you can just, just, as a, just to get a different result, try changing this number to something smaller. Uh, because the, the, this has 320 channels. So like, just pick a random number, 141. You'd pick a random number different from me and different from your neighbor, let's say. And then just run this again. And this will generate that, this will optimize uh, an image to activate this particular channel in this layer. You can also change the layer if you want. So again, you can go back to that lookup and you can put in another layer. And the, um, well, let's see how that comes out looking. So the way this works, this is gonna do it starts with a canvas of 200 by 240. So you might get something that looks like this. Your mileage may vary. 
Now, um, the way this works is that th these parameters mean the following. We start with a canvas of 240 by 200. The width is 240, the pixel, the height is 200. And it says octave N, that's the number of multi-scale octaves. They're called octaves even. I mean, octave is probably not the best word for it, but basically scales. So octave N means we're gonna upsample this thing twice so that there's three octaves. So we start with the, the base, which is 200 by 240. Then we expand it by a ratio of 1.4. So we basically will resize it so that it's 1.4 times bigger in both the width and the height. And then we'll do that again. We'll do it twice so that we have three octaves. And at each octave, it'll do this many iterations, um, 40. And so then, that, so th these are the parameters that you set. Uh, and then also you set these. So which layer and channel you want. And so then the code basically, I should really just put this here actually. Um, put all this at the, so all your parameters that you set are up here. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, I'm just making for clarity's sake. This will generate a random image. So basically a random image of white noise using NumPy. And then it'll throw it into render lap norm, which will do the Laplace normalization with this, with all these parameters, channel, take this image as its input. So image zero is the input. This many iterations, this many octaves, and then it will generate it, image one, and then it will display it down here. So, I mean, um, I, I wanna keep moving because we only have 15 minutes, but basically like later you can just mess around with it, try to change the different neurons. Remember that the channel must be less than the number of neurons that that channel, that, that layer has and you have that written above and if you want to later you can actually do you can see the you can actually trace this right this this is 141 mixed 4e 3x3 so we can go back mixed 4e one four uh what is it 4e pre-relu three three pre-relu see it's just really it's confusing so we got a pre-relu and then it's gonna be 141. So, I mean, I, I'll have to count basically. So it's in there somewhere, but basically we recreated one of these. And you can see that they, you know, there's all sorts of different patterns. The, um, the intuition between how these vary is that if you look at the really early layers, so let's look at COM2D, you see that the features are very abstract. They're very simple. You know, and some of these, I really like the early layers because they kind of just look like normal sort of glitch art, you know. Um, so they make very nice glitch art. And, um, oh, these are out of order. These are later. But basically, yeah, the early layers are, are more abstract. They start to get a little bit more complicated as you go. And if you go to like, you know, the middle ones, let's say 4B, that's where you get a nice sweet spot where they're complicated, but they're very well differentiated. Um, in the later layers, where you get really high, like mixed 5B, you see that the, the high level features become more and more complicated, but they also begin to look more like each other, kind of. And the reason for that is because all of them are sort of eating up the features below them. So they're all kind of being fed by the same features that's why they're not as well differentiated the, the last one these are out of order these should actually these are at the top or sort of like you know the the last layers basically so they're the most complicated um actually is that right i want to say that's what i thought that was the case yeah i'm pretty sure you have to find the inception diagram but anyway, that's if you want to look those up, that's what you'll get later. So, sorry. Uh, yeah. It seems no, you don't have to. I mean, the they're not all pre relu like. Um. Oh, maybe they're all. Yeah, I guess they're all pre relu. 
Well, I mean, I, like applied. well, I mean, it, it. These are all sort of like metaphors. So, like, really, the relu happens right at the at, at like. It's not really there's. It's not like a relu. You can think of it as a layer if you want, because it's the last operation. Like, it takes the sum of all the neurons and then it runs it through a. You could yeah. just think of it as a layer if you want, but but it but you know right. all metaphors. Yeah, um, which I guess I don't know why I don't know what what happens if if it were done the other way. It seems to be better to I don't know. Um, okay, so then render lap norm. So this is kind of where the deep stream notebook would end, and what I added here, this lap norm multi is basically the whole masking thing. So this function right here, you can declare it. And then this cell block will use it. Now what 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 is lapnorm multi compared to render lapnorm? Lapnorm multi is the same except it allows you to to specify multiple neurons to optimize for instead of one and to combine them with masks. And the masks, you're responsible for making them yourself using NumPy, basically. So it accepts them as matrices. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to, I'm going to take you through the, these cell blocks. So this goes, OK, let, let's, let's actually read this code. So we, st uh, HW 600 by 800. Now this, before in, in render lab norm, that was the initial canvas. And then the canvas would get multiplied by 1.4 times 1.4. But um, the problem with doing it that way is that um, you don't know how big you should make the mask. I, I wanted to make the mask at the at the biggest level so that it's so that the mask doesn't get uh, destroyed by upsampling it. Basically, then it becomes really not sharp. And so instead, I have a convenience function which tells you to specify the size of the canvas at the end. So this is going to be how big it is at the end like after the multi-scale resolution, it, it's easier to think of it that way. So basically, this is how big the image is going to be that you generate. And then octave n, octave scale, just tells you how many octaves, again, as before. This means that it'll start like 600, um, oh, like, oh, well, what was it? One divided by 1.4. No, wait, that doesn't make sense. What am I doing? Right, shouldn't this give me... Or, oh, no, sorry, sorry. Maybe it's one divided. I can't do this now. That's 600 raised to the 1.4. Is that? No, that doesn't even make it. That makes even less sense. What am I doing? 600 to, this, to, to the 1 over 1.4 power. Why does that work? You're trying to what? find like, what happened. What back. was it before? Like, what was at the beginning? Whatever. I can't okay. sure <laughs> uh, Take a logarithm. OK, anyway. The point is that you can you can go back. It'll be something like you know, four hundred or something. It'll start at that and ten iterations at each octave. So then this is how you specify. This goes okay. Now I have an array, and I have two objectives. This layer, this channel, plus this layer, this channel. So there's two neurons that we've picked, and you can have as many as you want, right? This could just be an array of multi multiple. And, it, and the time it takes, it, it has to do the optimization for each one individually. And so if you have five neurons that you're optimizing and combining them in any way, um, it takes five times as long as, as one. So just be aware of that. And then this mask, this is the mask. And the mask has to be sized in the following way. The height and width is the same as the image, so we just use HW. And then it has exactly as many channels as the number of objectives, because each channel is a mask for each for each um, neuron that you're optimizing. So there's two of them here, and so there's two channels here, and what each one is devoted to one. So like the way that we're going to mask this is going to be the first channel of of this mask structure, and the way that we're going to uh, mask this is the second channel of this mask structure. Now from here, like if you have not used NumPy, and I assume most of you have not, 
now it's going to start to get more weird for you. Um, one of the thing, how many people here have used NumPy for anything? A few of you, okay. So some of you will, will be familiar with these. Um, for those of you who are getting started with Python, definitely like NumPy is like the Swiss army knife of, of, uh, of Python. NumPy is basically stuff for making matrices, for doing matrix operations and so on. And this matrix, this is a H by W by two matrix. That is our mask that we apply. This is going to be what gets multiplied point for point by the gradients that, that we get. And then that, and the gradients are the pixel differences. So we're attenuating them basically. So this right here, um, so, so again, like this isn't a NumPy course. And so it, this won't make a lot of sense to you, but you can kind of read it. Um, so this goes, okay. The mask has three dimensions. So when you see a colon, that means all. Colon just means all. Um, so, so this goes, okay. For the entire height dimension, this is X, 0 to 150, first 150 columns, and channel the first channel, because it's indexed at 0, right? So the last thing is the channel. So channel 0, all, all rows, first 150 columns, turn it, make it 1. Everything is, starts at 0, but now we make it 1. So basically the, what that does is it says... The first um, 150 columns will mat will let all of this through. It'll it'll multiply this by the gradients for this by one, and then so you actually what you get is that's actually this. That's why you see some something being passed there. The um, and then what it does is it takes the next. 100 columns from, uh, from 150 to 250 and it says in channel 1 make that 0 0.5 and for channel 2 make that 0 0.5 as well. So then it's going to do a, a like a sort of half blend of both of them and you see that's why that's that's this. Like where it has a little bit of both. That's like basically from here to here. It's half and half. And then this goes okay from 250 to 400 which means from here to here, make that 1.0 for channel two. And so we only get this there. And then everything else is still zero. So we didn't address columns 400 to, eight, uh, to 800. And so the, this whole half is just zero. So it doesn't let in anything. And so it just stays just like noise. And the reason why it looks gray is that when it's generated, random uniform gives you numbers between zero and one. Um, and so adding a hundred, that means all the numbers are between a hundred and a hundred and one. So it's just the tiny differences that get amplified later. It starts everything gray and then just gives tiny little diffs. And so, so there actually is like little sparkles here, but they're hard to see because, because it's just between a hundred and a hundred and one. Um, this one does the same thing, except instead of starting with a random image of, of white noise, which is what this is, it starts with an image loaded from, from the web of a cat. And then it does the thing on top of the poor cat. And actually here it does it even simpler. So it goes, okay, first 200 columns, 1.0 for the neuron associated with this. And the next 200 columns, 1.0 associated with this. And so that's why you see a, the first half of it is the first neuron, the second half of it is the second neuron. Gnarly cat. What's cool is that they, they don't, they still kind of smoothly attach even though there's no blend. It's just, you know, hard stop between the two neurons, but the fill, it still has to take neighboring pixels into account. And so it kind of ends up seaming them together nicely. Like it's not a hard edge, um, which is kind of cool. Now, um, again, like this is stuff that you have to have a little bit of, of NumPy knowledge. 
but this will make a com more complicated um, uh, a, a more complicated mask, which is basically a, line a linear um, a linear uh, what do you call it? Like a linear blend. So actually, we'll look at the mask first. What it does is it generates mask. You can visualize the mask, right? So there's two channels again, and the first channel goes from black to white. So it goes from zero to one, left to right. And this goes from white to, the second one goes from white to black. So the second channel looks like this. The first channel looks like this. And so there's two channels. This gets multiplied by this. And the second one gets multiplied by this. And if you look at the result, here's the result. So what do you notice? Like the, the, it's, it looks like a crossfade. And what happens is that in the middle, because we're letting half of the gradients for each one go through, the process actually sort of converges on an image that half satisfies both objectives at the same time. So like a compromise. It's like gives us features that are kind of good for both. So that's really cool. It's not, it's not like we generated a thing of only this and then a thing of only this and then just blended them together. It actually generates stuff that looks like it's halfway between these two channels. So you can try changing these numbers again. Like if you, uh, you do have to remember to declare, if you haven't already, declare lapdorm multi. And then you can go down here if you want and say, you know, change these numbers, change the layers if you want, like make 22 and 19, let's say. And then run this. You can change the layers if you want. And now it'll, it'll take a little bit longer because this is actually pretty big now. Um, and also that it um, has to compute the, the gradients for two channels at the same time. So this will take a little while, but, um, but it'll give you a different thing each time. So I'll let this kind of keep going. We only have two minutes, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna try to wrap up. There's a few more cells here that I want to at least tell you what they do, even if we don't get time to use them too much. Um, the next cell here is the same as the last one, except it makes a except the way it makes the mask is it makes concentric it makes a circle in, it makes basically this is the mask right, so it's like a cir circle circular blend. It's like a circular gradient. So this is. Uh, the first mask is white on the in the middle and and black on the outside and then this one is the opposite and so you have like a circular filter and so this is the result of that right there's two channels selected you see how the outside looks different from the middle and the thing is like there's no limit to how you can compose these masks you can like I'm, I'm doing simple things like making circles and, and rectangles, but they can be complicated shapes as well. And one technique that I, that I have used is, oh, here's the result of this. See, it's totally different now. I don't like this one as much. Uh, one thing that I, I did do um, is, for, oh, this <laughs> I moved this to my disk, which I have actually. I moved it just to save space. The things I do, I'll just show you really quickly the video. It's also online. Um, so this, for example, uh, I think I had this at NIPS two years ago. Yeah, you can make masks that are using pictures. So I take a picture and I'll segment it. I'll segment the picture of a person's face using some nearest neighbor pixel or something like that. And uh, yeah, this is that's Jan LeCun. <laughs> Um, and uh, use that as my mask, right? Uh, all of these, this is basically using the stuff that I just showed you. I, I don't have any code for um, in that notebook. I have it on GitHub, but not in that notebook. If anyone's interested in using this, I can show you, but it's just not in that notebook, so it's not necessarily super easy to use. I'm trying to make it easier to use, but that's a process. <laughs> Um, this is also doing all this canvas distortion stuff. So you can make like crazy animations like this, right? I have this online. So there's definitely more secret sauce here. I mean, it's not secret. I have it online, but it's it's definitely more complications than 
than um, what you see here, but it's roughly the same thing. There's just, you know, if you, if you feel comfortable with NumPy, which you should definitely try to become because it's superpower if you have it, you um, can, can make your own masks for this kind of stuff. And then the, the, I'm going to wrap it up here because we're already over time, but I just want to mention one more thing, which is I showed you the different masks. And this cell right here, oh, this is a circular mask. And then this cell right here shows how to make video. Um, and the video, if you look at it, all it is is it's the same as you saw before, except there's one more other thing. See, it starts with an image, make a random image noise, and then it creates a loop. And what it will do is that it, in each iteration of the loop, it'll take that image, it'll make it the input to Lapdoor Multi, and the output, so it'll overwrite itself. And then it'll save it, also it'll save it to disk, and then it'll download it over here, and then it will resize it, it'll crop it, so it'll take this thing that it overwrote, crop it by five pixels, and you could change that, so it'll make a crop, and then it'll resize it back to the same size as the input was before, and that has the effect of sort of a zoom in. And because we overwrote it, now it becomes the new input to the next round of this. So this will generate 120 frames. And it's not actually displaying it anymore. Um, yeah, I got it's not displayed here. But basically, that's how you make those zoom in things. Uh, I don't have a version. I don't have a... I think I might have a... Hmm, I don't have a... Yeah, I, don't, I don't know where I have a... Basically, it's one of those zoom in things, right? And you could do an infinite zoom. Right. So this cell will show you how to make video. If you really want to do this stuff at heavy duty, it's probably best to set it up on a different environment than Colab, but you can do it in Colab. Um, so that's worth knowing. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this. This is all for you guys to use if you wish to, it's, and if you have questions about it, let me know. Um, next week, we will, I, will, uh, I punted this paper space stuff and the neural style tutorial to next week. So we'll probably kind of like do a small introduction of generative models, but mostly focus on doing this because, yeah, everything takes longer than you always think. Um, and then uh, we will also start talking about generative models. We won't really do generative models, at least not in any practical sense, until, until after, the, until after the, the small break that we have while I'm gone. Uh, and, and, and first we'll do presentations. And remember, um, yeah, this is... I was asked earlier about about the mini presentations. I had this in this slide last week as well. Three to five minutes. Um, you don't have to present it if you don't want to. Just email me if you want to present it to me per, uh, personally. You can do that too. Um, you can also just email it to me. Like the, all I'm really looking for is like effort. So, um, and you can use any of these tools, but you can also go off the board. You can use the Deep Dream stuff if you want. This is kind of the stuff that we've roughly used. I haven't really shown Wakinator that much yet. I don't know if I've shown that at all, actually. Um, so maybe that's also something that punted enough. You see this class, like it never runs out of things we can do. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions before we, before we What's break? What's the difference between the um, collab model, the uh, version of the The one that I have, it's, it should be the same if you watched it. it. Yeah, I think maybe I put it on Colab later, but it's all the same code. Okay, uh, the only difference is one is the individual Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Colab one is probably more up to date. Um, so it's probably, you could always overwrite the code in the Jupyter one from there. Yeah. You have a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you talk about um, deep dream and how they implement, you said it was trying to increase the activation of everything. But in this, yeah. in this notebook, it seems like we're increasing yeah. activation of like one neuron right. or yeah. two that we choose. Yes. Yeah. So if we really want, and I, I kind of can see that as well, because like you'll see a repeating pattern, but it doesn't really look to me like if you don't see eyes and faces everywhere, right? Yeah. So would that be, if, if you just, you know, maybe think about classic network where you're like, here's the objective and you have a, a regular objective. If, the obje if that array was just filled with like every neuron in an entire, um, layer, would then you get something that's you, more like... Yeah, exactly. You would get something more like Deep Dream. And, and the, TensorFlow, the TensorFlow example goes into that. I, I got rid of some of those examples, but the original TensorFlow example has that.
Was, was there a question back there? Yeah. <laughs> Did you do the criminal justice tutorial uh, last year I left? Yeah. Uh, but it's mostly a rehash of of, um, of what was in the of the old one, and, and actually some of the stuff that I did at the end of the term of velocity paper space stuff I'm gonna show next week. Yeah. Um. Anything else? Okay. Cool. Um. See you guys. I'm gonna put this online later, and uh, I'll let you know when it's up.